I was so happy with myself just now. The setup, everything was working and I was chirping away and talking to you all, opening the podcast and being so happy to feel like a human being. And I got about a minute and a half into it and I was doing a little playing and I looked up and press record on the camera. What a genius. But here we are, take two and... I get to do a really condensed version of what I just said because it was probably a little too wordy. But I'm just feeling good, finally feeling like a human being. Um, Not quite enough to have recorded the podcast last night to be out this Monday morning, but nonetheless, it will be out on a Monday, finally back on schedule. Had the whole Mother's Day hang here with the family yesterday, which was fantastic. And just feeling really good about things in general and excited to not just play for you and talk about some practice stuff that is getting me motivated to get my chops back in shape, having really been on the back foot with the illness the past weeks. Um, But to, to talk about being excited, uh, you know, concerning the blog, concerning my Substack, and finally having found kind of a cool purpose for it, and to really hook people up who are that who are engaged, the real like the coffee drinkers, the daily readers, the people who really go and check out every single email and message and episode of the podcast that I put out. Um, I'm kind of marrying the Substack with my insane library of bootlegs uh, that have been collected over now several decades. And putting out a song a day. That's the thing. A song a day. Going to try and do 365 days in a row. They're all going to be live, unreleased, thankfully uncopywritten, but yeah, live, unreleased bootlegs of things that were really uh, important to me over the past 25, 30 years in terms of my growth as a musician. Things I have beaten to death in terms of listening to them hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of times. And I'm going to share all that with you. I have been. We're in... The, uh, the end of the first week, uh, six or seven of them are out there right now. And we kind of, it's a rabbit hole. Uh, I opened up with one of my just favorite sort of musical moments on scratchy bootleg sounding. You know, again, this was a mini disc recorder with this, that little Sony mic. I opened this whole thing with uh, the Anthony Parks, Sylvia Gordon, Nick Casper, uh, my good friend Peter Stoltzman, we were all, um, actually I don't know Nick that well, but we were, Sylvia, D'Anthony and Peter, we were all in Boston around Berkeley at the same time in the late 90s, and D and Sylvia had a band called Kudu, and there was a gig live at House of Blues uh, in Boston, late 1999, I bootlegged and I have it here, and uh, that was what I opened uh, this this journey with, Uh, I'll, I'll play you a little clip now. That is an acoustic drum set. No triggers, no nothing. That's the genius of D. And this whole bootleg. It's seven or eight tracks I think they played on this show. Um, I have them all. I shared one of them to open a song a day. And it sort of took off from there. This Day two was uh, Kranz Carlock Lefebvre um, from the year 2000. Tim in rare form uh, with the with the filter and just the, the whole band sounding amazing sort of early on in the the career of that trio they were really sort of conceptually glued together and about to start this 20 something year run that they've been on um, so it's re- it's all moments like that and sort of rare things you know uh, I'm, I'm trying as hard as I can to ease off on the Michael Brecker and Pat Metheny pedal because of course those are two of my biggest influences and I could do 365 days of just one of those guys um, so I'm really trying to be Uh, delicate with your ears and with the audience's ears because I don't want to just beat you over the head with that stuff but I do have aside from the really obvious stuff like nothing personal and 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 all those kind of classic tracks I have um 
that's something I shared on day three, which was Mike Brecker playing with the Eastman uh, Eastman School of Music, the studio orchestra up in Rochester, New York. Um, so it's like a student ensemble, and um, he's ripping. They play Pauls, Don Gronick's Pauls, made famous by Steps Ahead. Um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm reading the entire week's uh, uh, information to you here, but you, 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 you get where I'm going. I'm really excited to be sharing these like massively important bootlegged recorded moments of live shows with, with the audience. Um, it's the thing to provide value to the, to the paid subscribers on the, on the platform. And I'm really, the feedback has been awesome. And regardless of whether one person listens to it or whether 1000 people decide to sign up for a subscription and, and, and listen to it, it's just been a re- it's really good discipline for me to go back and, and like do this every day and, and, you know, get posts ready to go. So I'm like two or three days ahead. Um, it's also great to write a little bit about it and give some context in each of the posts that I put up there. And it's just amazing to hear all of this music again and to kind of have it in one place, like the best of the best, like I'm really cherry picking the best moments. I'm not putting up entire concerts. I'm cherry picking the best songs and the best solos and, and all of that. So it's really kind of nice to have it all in one place almost like a best of the best playlist. So that's what's just started. Uh, Like I said, we're on day six, day seven tomorrow. (coughs) And um, really exciting. So if you want to check that out, it's linked in the show notes. Uh, It's on my Substack, my blog, my mailing list. I've talked about it a bunch. Um, Yannickwistala.substack.com. And of course, all the free stuff is still going on there as well. We had this week, I believe I did another episode of Learn Something Right Now. Absolutely where I compared Katy Perry's fireworks to John Coltrane's Giant Steps and sort of made a case for how they are not that different in terms of uh, fundamental complexity of like picking out root notes and how we approach listening and training our ear. You know, maybe your ear isn't ready to go straight to something like Giant Steps or 26-2 or Countdown or one of those tunes, but perhaps you can pick out the chorus of Katy Perry's firework and that's the right part that's the right um uh, step on the path to just picking out root motions no matter what the style or the complexity of the music and you can graduate or move up towards more complex stuff but the exercise the fundamental process still stays the same so i'm having fun doing that um that was something i wanted to do more often but we're only on episode six of that so far in the past couple of months i try and do it like once every week, once every couple of weeks, when something comes up, and I think, oh, that's a good little topic for a five-minute read, and I'll try and include some audio and really just something to, to add to your process. That is, that's always free. That's always there to all subscribers, um, no matter whether you pay or not. So, yeah, that, the, the, the blog is, has been kind of exciting. Um, I have some other things that really just came up this morning, ideas that are kind of starting to get off the back burner onto the front burner and they are starting to cook. Can't really talk about them just yet, but maybe next week. So I'm excited about that. Also, before the Steve Smith Vital Information Tour starts uh, a month from today, I want to say something like that. <clears throat> I actually recorded an interview with Steve when when we were in Phoenix, Arizona on the last night of our previous tour. So that is going to be an episode of the podcast maybe next week. Next week or the week after. Really nice. It's it's not long. It's only about 35, 40 minutes because we were so short on time with the schedule. But it's really uh, a nice conversation. Really appreciate it, Steve, taking the time to do that. So that's coming up. Uh, so it's sort of all systems go here. And now... In between hydrating here, I have to get my chops way back into shape. Even though I had a couple of gigs at the beginning of the month, uh, I've really backed off of practicing just because I have been feeling like crap. And it's been all I can do to to just sort of maintain the basics of life, never mind music. <laughs> So yesterday, no, day before yesterday, I didn't practice at all yesterday, doing the Mother's Day hang, but day before yesterday and a little bit this morning, I just have this shape of familiar sounding vocabulary. Of course, it's uh, altered. Um, It's altered, it's a five, going to one. Just creating a shape out of it. 
I'm not sure if I transcribed that exact shape from someone. I'm trying to picture, uh, I'm trying to think who comes to mind when I play that. Um, but right now it's not jumping out as, oh, that was Dexter Gordon or that was Train or that was Miles or Lee Morgan or something. It's, it's something I kind of came up with, but it's based on much vocabulary and much information that has come before me and all of us. <clears throat> and sometimes that's all I need, even if it has kind of nothing to do with what I'm doing musically right now. Um, I have, I guess I should talk about this because now, well, now everyone, in, everyone involved knows. So, um, I can talk about this, um, with the trio and with the recording. I'm not about to cancel it. Don't worry. That's not a thing. Uh, it's absolutely happening and marching on towards Argentina in August. But sadly, Nico Bicaro, um, our drummer, is not able to make the recording sessions. And um, I think I said a few months ago when I first started talking about this that there was going to be something uh, that I would have to pivot on. I, I was thinking it might be more of a musical thing and that we would get down there and all the music I wrote would kind of be pants and we'd just have to change it and, uh, and, and just move on to something else and pivot in that sense and be open to, to making change in the moment. But... And, and hey, that might still happen. Um, let's talk about the music in a second, because what has happened now, what I've needed to do is to pivot on a musician. Um, and Nico got just so many uh, requests and offers that I couldn't possibly compete with them, either financially, which wasn't the, the issue anyway, but just in terms of the, the sheer length and, and quantity of them. You know, I wasn't offering Nico 70 gigs this year. Uh, I certainly wasn't offering that kind of money either, you know, and between him working with Richard Bona, uh, who added just tons and tons and tons of dates to the schedule, and uh, Daffa Youssef, and I believe Sylvain Lug, and just really a bunch of people. His year, his year, his next 12 months just got completely insane uh starting almost immediately so he was i uh, he was bummed out and he sent me a long message and like man it's not about the money but it you know that it's it's just impossible to balance everything out with that you know quant sheer quantity of work being offered and that happens and here we are you know, here i am rather in a pivot moment so um i finally spoke to tom this morning i really I had wanted to figure out a solution. You know, obviously my first thing was like, well, how am I going to do this? Like, I'm not canceling uh, for sure. We are in motion with the pre-sale, which is going great, by the way. Thank you for all being a part of that. If you want to be a part of this, by the way, links are below the YouTube video there at my website. You can be a part of the pre-sale. Um, and if you are, I've talked about this a little bit and I'm developing it more as the weeks go by, but these bonus tracks, these like Japanese style bonus tracks are definitely happening. Three of them to everyone involved in the pre-sale. You actually get three extra songs that will never be released to the public. Um, they'll never be streamed. They'll never be up on Spotify or Apple Music. So that was just kind of a cool way to give everyone on the bleeding edge, everyone, early, all the early adopters and all the, the biggest fans way more value and just a way to say, hey, thanks for being involved and obviously helping financially ahead of time. That is always a, a, a weight off one's shoulders to know kind of where your sales are at even before you've you've uh, recorded the music. So thank you for all of that. And anyone who still wants to get involved, of course you can at yannickwasdala.com. It's all linked everywhere. There are links. Um, so yeah, so the pivot has been to, I had to sit there and think about it and just listen to music and I'd written really about 70% of the music I wanted to record with Nico and Tom and I kind of had to throw that in the trash. I was re I was, <laughs> maybe it would have even been better, more dramatic perhaps if I had shared some of that with you guys and maybe I'll still share some of those things we're not going to record now with you just to show you and explain kind of maybe that's a good podcast episode where I kind of highlight which direction I was going and then because I was writing for specific musicians when one of those musicians is no longer available I really had to change kind of the concept and the sound and the direction that I wanted to go in um, largely based on who is going to replace Nico in the band and come down to Argentina and uh, make this record and that is my great friend and just unbelievable musician Cliff Armand on drums 
Um, you may know him from Wayne Kranz, from Michelle Camillo, from many, many gigs over the years. Um, just a phenomenal musician. And also important that we're close friends and we, we talk a lot and we are, you know, we've kind of had that since we first met. That's coming up on many years now. Not, not, not yet 20, I don't think, but I think it's been at least 15 we've been playing together, maybe more. Yeah, actually, maybe it is 20 since the early to Christ. Okay, getting old. So maybe it is really around 20 years since I know Cliff, uh, early 2000s, moving to New York. Um, wow. Okay, so there you go. So that that's a huge part of it. Like, I want to go down there with people I really know well. Um, not that there isn't value in, in working with people that are new um, and trying new things, and but we are going to try new things and play. I think we're all going to be able to play differently from perhaps any way you've heard us before. So that's sort of the direction I'm going in now, and I've been listening to completely different music the past week that I've known about this from before. I've been writing different music. Um, I still hear a vocal or choir-like element. that I was talking about that a few weeks ago. I definitely hear that, but in a just in a different context now and with a different foundation underneath it. So it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out. I'm thinking about doing some sequencing things and playing along to some tracks and maybe playing along to it to inspire the live performance and then taking them out afterwards. There are all kinds of things that I hear now with this different sound, um, a different drum sound that we're going to be working with. So that's the update there. Um, I'm really, I mean, it's just going to be, is going to be an amazing trip uh, no matter what. And I'm sure the outcome is going to be highly musical. Like it can't not be highly musical working with these two guys. Um, I'm going to take a precautionary throat lozenge here just in case my throat starts to say, oh, you know what? You really thought you were feeling good, but you get 30 minutes into a podcast and we're going to pull the plug. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a lot of information I know, um, but that's, that's the update of what's going on with everything and really now the what was really important for me is to feel great compositionally get moving forward towards the album forward towards the album and feeling great playing wise and even though i don't intend to play like lots of altered licks and five chords going to one and solos and stuff like that there are going to be uh some intricate moments on this album maybe more so than any album i've ever made I think this is going to challenge me technically more than anything I've tried to write before, which is kind of exciting. And it's not in a sort of Chick Corea electric band sense uh, of, of sort of jazzy unison lines, but I definitely feel and I'm hearing some unison stuff with keyboards and bass, some things that are kind of angular, some very specific sonic choices. Um, I've been listening to all kinds of stuff from like Gonzalo Rubalcaba to Royal Blood to Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross and uh, Bill Laswell and Zawinul Syndicate. Like really some stuff I haven't checked out that much that recently. And uh, it's really fun, you know, revisiting some of my biggest influences over the past 30 years and sort of slotting myself or finding out what my slot is now and what my sound is and of course not wanting to do what I've done before you know I don't want to do one way out again that was all improvised um I don't want to do it only happens once from 11 years ago which was also all improvised but a very specific sound and kind of groovy and electronic and but also jazzy so I'm definitely looking for a completely new direction. That's always the focus when it comes to making records for me. I just never want to have done the same thing twice. Um, so that, that that's where I'm at. And it's, uh, <coughs> sometimes it's a little scary because time is, the, is ticking away. The sands are falling through the hourglass as we head towards like departure date to go to Argentina and this whole machine that is, it has been kicked into gear and this project that is in motion, sort of whether I like it or not now, but I, I, I definitely like it. It just, uh, it doesn't stop it being sometimes a little scary uh, when, when you get in that sort of self-doubt mode. 
and the the when the switch was flipped and it was like okay nico's not doing it and before i had cliff i was like really in sort of really in the dmz the no man's land like uh okay i'm sort of floating around what do i do here I had to come up with a new musical direction and then who sort of fit that musical direction but also i want to write for that person so there was a lot of soupiness going on in the brain for a few days there when i when i finally i was like okay i'm gonna go in this direction let's call cliff let's do this <coughs> you know i'd I'd batted around a bunch of different ideas and i think a, a bunch of ideas also of people i might work with in the future in the studio as well just sort of put out feelers in my brain like okay well this person would sound like this and i could do that with that person and it was it was interesting because that part of my brain had been shut off for months thinking that it was just going to be my trio and my band and we already had this chemistry and i was really thinking about where are we going to take this chemistry where does this chemistry go next that, i think that's the saddest part of nico not doing the record for me is that we worked so hard on that last album we were able to play some live shows we all know each other very well of course and it was really I was really looking forward to finding out where the chemistry would go. Um, so, yeah, it's tough. And, of course, there are, like, 40 amazing drummers out there that could possibly do the gig. And at some point, I was just like literally laying on a couch with these headphones on, listening to music, and I, I heard something. I was like, oh, that that's interesting to me right now. That's the thing that fits my brain right now, and let's see where we can go with that. Let's see if I can reboot that feeling of wanting to know where the trio was going with Nico and Tom. Let's see if I can reboot that with Cliff and and figure out where this is going with Cliff now. So, yeah, very interesting. And all part of it, all part of the band leader wearing the band leader hat. And um, doesn't it doesn't get any easier. Maybe it even becomes more difficult, especially the more albums you make and the more you've done, it's harder to find the new thing. Um but it definitely gets more interesting. At least it has for me the older I've gotten. Um, uh, let's see. Ah. Yeah, there are going to be some unison things like that on there. I really got to... Really got to get that in shape. Um, uh, let's see, what was I working on? gotta love the scam likely calls right they are just way too often these days where was i Definitely, uh, I want to mix in simple, um, simple but rich, sometimes dense, uh, sometimes dense but simple. That's going to be an interesting one because I want a big sound. Like, I'm going into this thinking so much about sound and about, you know, the, the albums I've been listening to, even if they don't musically and stylistically and genre wise influence me in my writing and my playing right now. <clears throat> there are things about the production that I think, whoa, that knocks me out. Like I hear the first chord or the first note or the first bar of music on an album and think, wow, I want to listen to this whole thing. So no matter what I end up coming up with stylistically, genre-wise or whatever, 
That's the experience I want to give the listener. So I'm really, maybe more than ever, thinking about the sound right now. I think we kind of got close with One Way Out in terms of, it was the closest to what I heard before we recorded to what I heard when I got the master. I mean, mean, we're talking really close. Like Juan Pablo, like that was, did an, an insanely good job of that for me. Like that delivered the closest I think maybe I've ever gotten, I'm not sure, maybe it's just because it's the most recent one that's influencing me, it's the one I know the best now. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely conscious of that again. And um, and being open to like different techniques, techniques that I haven't used before, methods of recording, you know, methods of routing the pedals. That's what I'm really, now I have a little bit of health back in my body, I'm really looking forward to being able to be quite diverse in my work day this week when it comes to uh, dedicating time to actually exercising, working out, Jesus, maybe even hitting a tennis ball for the first time in a couple of months. Holy crap. <clears throat> and then getting down on my hands and knees and plugging in pedals and, and doing parallel routing and all kinds of stuff, different combinations of sounds, even if it's j- just the bass sound on its own, different preamps, different compressors, different octave pedals, different fuzzes, you know, what level of dirt do I want? Am I going for, you know, dark glass or am I going for big muff or like what's going on here? So I'm really looking forward to those kind of experiments happening more and more on a daily basis and taking notes, really important, especially in this part of the process of writing and experimenting and finding sounds. To me, that's just as important, um, like making notes and taking photographs of pedals when I get the setting that I want, you know, and putting that in a folder and just generally being organized as a producer, as a writer, as a composer, as an artist, hugely important. It's not just learn a bunch of music and then go to the studio and record it, in my case. Uh, it's really a lot of, lot of layers to it and a lot of levels to to get to in order to get the best result and to understand, you understand every single layer uh, as as it happens. And then when I don't understand it to, you know, to get help and to get help from the pe- the best people I possibly can. So that's, uh, that's the mode I'm in right now. And I really should be doing some, doing some real basics. Definitely feel it in the left hand a little bit, a lack of uh, lack of stamina in certain certain shapes, certain places on the instrument. Just comes from like not really doing any work for five or six days, which is such a drag, you know. I'm the practice guy. I'm the guy who spends insane amount of hours with the instrument to really mitigate any any bullshit like this, and just being forced into submission and not being able to do that is. Uh, it's quite a drag. It's a mental strain as well, or a mental drain rather, because I think about it way too much when I'm not practicing and I kind of get depressed about it. I get depressed about not spending time with the instrument. So I'm vastly happier today <laughs> than I was perhaps most of last week, uh, just from the fact that I can get to the instrument and, and do some good work. Even if it's just a major scale. Ah. 
basically you're never too old to play scales, major scales. You're never too old to play simple. You're never too old or too experienced or too pro, dude, to do the work, to do the real basics. Um, I think there's, yeah, you know, like I said just now, I was feeling a little bit of stamina issues in the left hand when I got up, when I got up high in the register. So why not go back to and make sure all your right hand fingering stuff is is in shape and is sequentially correct for what it is you're trying to execute. Sixty seconds, ninety seconds, not that long, and I feel better already. I feel, I feel better about my playing. I feel warmer. You know, I've been talking a lot. Obviously, this is not an ideal practice situation, but I definitely feel better just for that ninety seconds. Feel like I can fly a little, fly a little higher now when it comes to playing other. <laughs> Playing other material. There's the idea again. Uh, there. So now maybe, maybe now it's cycle of uh, cycle of fourth uh, of that line. Try and do it in every key. Mm -hmm. And on. That was. You hear how I decelerated on that? I was like, I started to think about it. I'm like, stop thinking about it and just do it. You've done it in five other keys. It's the same shape. We play the dumbest instrument on earth. You can literally just move the same shape around. It should be that simple. I guess, obviously, saying it's simple and, and stating the obvious and then actually doing it, of course, you need repetition, you need experience and time with the shape, but eventually, C sharp should be no different from F minor. Um, and where was I going? C sharp should go to F sharp. It's amazing sometimes how just going up a half step kind of messes with the brain a little bit and it's not as easy as like oh just move it up a half step just move the shape up <clears throat> it should be and technically it is but sometimes if you're not prepared for it or you're not sort of like hearing ahead i like yeah we should talk about that for a minute hearing ahead when I'm improvising, or actually in many different situations, I'm I'm doing something called. Uh, do I call it that? Fuck that might. This might have been the first time I've ever called it anything, but basically I'm trying to. Is it anticipatory or? I'm not sure. See, I haven't thought about it enough before because I can't explain it right away. But I basically am sort of aware of what's coming now. Whether that's like fulfilling my role as a bass player and playing a song and knowing which section to go to next or knowing a key change that's coming up, that's sort of hearing ahead and being prepared. Um, when I'm improvising, I'm hearing the harmony. You know, I know where I'm heading, which is really important. And it gives me, oh, it gives me like a, just a bunch more sort of resolution ability. You know, if I know what what chord is coming next or it's like a chess player thinking ahead well a good one is thinking ahead like 10 15 moves i guess or maybe they're magnus carlson you're thinking ahead the whole game 
Hikaru, you're probably just worrying about you know how much streaming revenue you're missing by actually playing chess somewhere. Um, that's one for all the chess nerds out there. But yeah, it's kind of a little bit like that conceptually, like thinking ahead. But but rather not thinking, but hearing ahead. Like um, if I'm on a five chord, even though I'm even though I'm in it and I'm in that moment and I'm hearing you know I'm hearing what what could possibly happen within that chord. I'm also hearing as long as the next chord is the one. I'm I'm really hearing like where I'm going. So I'm almost superimposing the one over the five in my head so I can really fluidly get to all the resolution points, all the possible resolution points with, uh, with great ease. I think that's when you hear, when you hear a great musician or you, you hear someone you like and they're, they're improvising and they're playing melodically and it's really fluid and you think, wow, they make that sound so easy. There's probably an element of that um, to their playing that sort of, you know, hearing ahead and knowing what's coming and being really in control of resolution points and just being able to hear the harmony and react to it and reacting to it sort of ahead of time. It's like, I guess, a race car driver, you know, or maybe a bobsled uh, driver or race. They all know what's coming. They all have a map of the of the racetrack in their head. It's kind of like that with form. If you're playing music that has form, of course, <coughs> especially in jazz, you know, American songbook, jazz standard vocabulary. There's like that racetrack, you know, when the, when the, when the hairpin is and you know where the chicane is and you know where the straight is, you know, you know, like Coltrane two five could be the, the, the chicane and the straight could be the, the modal section of the tune where you've got one chord to play on for four bars or eight bars or something. You, know, you kind of know that structure, you know the form, you know the layout. So you can anticipate those things. You can be ready for them. And that's kind of what I'm doing. It's a little easier and more obvious if it's an obvious form like a 12-bar blues, for instance, or um, a, a standard, um, a well something well-known, something that everyone in the in that little click or niche uh sort of knows that you go to a jam session or you play a gig and somebody calls a tune and like okay everyone's night has a thousand eyes great everyone sort of agrees upon this sort of harmonic contract that's uh, been written um or out of nowhere or whatever the tune is and so you can all be prepared for all of those turns and all those straightaways and you know that's kind of a good place to get that together i think i think i learned a lot from playing jazz standards it's not something i do very much at all anymore other than in my practice routine because it does help me be able to do that on the fly you know if i don't know something very well like i can you know like a racetrack i know there's going to be a left there's going to be a right there's going to be a chicane there's going to be a hairpin there's going to be a hill like <clears throat> I know there could be all of these components to the track. So I know that there could be, you know, there are a finite number of components that could be in a form, for instance, so I can really be prepared for almost anything. And then the unknown is what another musician might throw at you, a reharmonization that wasn't written or a rhythmic idea that challenges the bar line um, of where the chords are moving and challenges your ability to hear one time signature superimposed over another, for instance. There are all of those kind of X factors. Uh, but fundamentally, really, uh, it's, it's, it's a great thing to be aware of form. And also when you're improvising, perhaps there is no form. Um, but to me, the storytelling comes when, when, you can take, when you can create a form out of nothing. You know, when there is no when there's not a single note of music written on the page, like that's basically one way out. That's basically my last album. That's what we did. Almost zero music written on the page, but we created form. We created structure out basically out of thin air, but based on all of our sensibilities of playing structured music before and those influences of structured music from before. <clears throat> and yeah, we were able to come up, you know, uh, ensemble wise that's even an even bigger challenge for three people or more to be on the same page without having to discuss it or arrange something or talk about anything you know just go in a room 
press record and start playing and start to for form to start to come out of the music so that's something i'm yeah i want to be more so than like the licks and the lines and the ability to move certain shapes around the instrument i'm more i want my set of skills in that world of form to be really switched on for the for the rec for the upcoming recording and i think just conceptually moving forward as an artist and a band leader because <coughs> it kind of it means i can exist in in multiple worlds um at the same time i'm not just locked into one way of playing um or one way or feeling like i'm locked into one way of playing of course most of us are not locked into any single way of playing but it can feel like that sometimes you feel like you're relying on the same sort of bag of tricks sometimes and the same vocabulary keeps coming out and you're not as inspired or you don't feel perhaps that you're able to update that or to improve upon it or to develop it I guess develop is the, the, the better word. Had this uh, brief discussion with Ruslan about it. I posted on my Clips channel. Um, I think I called it maybe the best version of Crush we've ever played. And we just played a really fun version of Bob Reynolds' tune, Crush. Maybe I can pull that up here on YouTube and show you what I'm talking about. It's actually, I'm going to take the bass off. This is a great way to uh, sort of encapsulate everything I'm talking about. And, um, and kind of bring the podcast to a close potentially on a um, on a good bit of information. Yannick was done a clips. There is an entire clips channel. There it is. Maybe the best version of Crush we've ever played. Here it is. Woo! That's loud. So for those of you who haven't heard Crush before, it actually doesn't normally start like that. <coughs> Already, I'm stepping away from the form. And this is on YouTube, by the way. You can go listen to the whole thing. I'm not going to play the whole thing. It's 12 minutes long. Um, but in that moment, for instance, Bob understands that... Well, hang on a second. <laughs> Having put the bass down now, I need the bass just to show you what's going on there. Bob under, understands. That's a dumb word to use. Bob uh, realizes what's what I'm doing. And normally, the tune... I, I just start the tune... A minor to F minor 7 flat 5 I put some other chords in there sometimes and I'm and sometimes I'll walk walk a little bass line but really keeping with those two chords normally like that's that's the vibe so what I do in this version is immediately get away from that I think I went down a whole step I think I did something like that. Let's see. Yep, okay. So I walk down. And you see Bob go like, okay, well, this is not what we normally do. And he turns around and he's like, hey, do you want it? Like, hey, do you want to do something here? Um, this is what I love about this band. It's very open, as you're about to hear, because we get way off off book shall we say with this with this when we get to the piano solo but that's it you know bobble here hey we're doing something different great looks around at me hey you want to do something here and i could t i could have taken five minutes there if i wanted to to go on a harmonic exploration to do a bunch of stuff that was loosely based <coughs> on bob's tune but kind of not not really like just getting away from it and improvising I, I said, no, I shook my head. I was like, no, I'm just, you know, kind of messing with the intro. Let's play the form. And just because I wanted to wait, I didn't want to feel, I wasn't feeling comfortable then. Had I been feeling comfortable, I could have said, yeah, great, let me do it. And I would have just gone and it would have had a completely different uh, shape to it. But as, as we get into it, I get to the five chord and get back up to the one. little walking up some chordal things Russell's getting his shit together and you know everyone's sort of like getting in sort of in the pocket of where we're at I kind of lean back and give a little cue like here we go and we get into the melody Russell doesn't have the volume up on his piano 
And we play the tune. I like we play the tune down pretty pretty straight-ish. Very sensitive. Um, we only played it once this time on the way in. Sometimes we play it twice. So just highlighting a few things that are different sort of right away from how we, you know, quote, unquote, ooh, excuse me, damn, how we quote unquote normally do it. Um, we get into more of a groove than being open. So there are already things we're just like, already we know something is happening that is not sort of, you know, again, quote unquote normal. Um, <laughs> but we're playing on the form that's the important thing to note here for bob solo we are playing on the form even though we might pedal here and there or reharmonize a couple of chords And Bob Solo ends in a spot where it could have gone up and it could have gone on again for another chorus or two. And we we chose to take it down there. That may have been dictated a little bit more by Gene because he played a big drum fill but then came down. And that's the, that's the control. That's the creative control all four of us have in the band, even though it's Bob's band. So that's a nice situation to be in. And we trust each other. Like if Gene decides this is the end of Solo, we're like, great. This is the end of the fucking solo. <laughs> There's no like, no, nah, man, keep on playing. Unless, of course, Bob is feeling it and he can then cue through the music to say, you know what? I want to go again. What do you think? But it's a question. It's not an order. You know, it's like, <coughs> and there are so many ways to answer that question as well. So it, it's, it's an amazing dynamic. And when you get into, like, I'm afforded, and I guess you guys are too through me doing this. I'm afforded uh, the luxury of being able to listen back to this stuff all the time, just any time I want, and being able to review things after gigs. This is why I record my practice. This is why I record my gigs. Um, because this, the, what I'm explaining to you right now is the kind of thing that goes through my head and is the kind of thing when I give some review of this to myself uh, you know after the show it's the kind of thing that sticks with me like the good things stick with me I, I know what's working I know what's not I know what I'd like to avoid doing again I know I, I can then hear what I kind of missed and was like oh if only I could have taken it to that next level so okay the next gig I'm I'm not trying to do the same thing conceptually again but maybe I'm thinking about the energy or a, a tempo thing or a sound thing or a time thing or an interaction thing or an ensemble thing or a melodic thing. There are like so many elements to it that I can carry forward. Or I, I'm not trying to recreate what we did before, but I am trying to take it musically um, to another place, whether that's upper level, uh, leveling up or whatever you want to call it, what cheesy uh, title you want to give it. Basically, it is all about trying to find something new and build upon your strengths and build upon what became stronger on the gig that you're listening to. So that's the end of Bob Solo, kind of a... Um, and this could have gone either way. I'm just comping. This is almost a bass solo, but not really. Or is it? Did I play a solo on this? Shit, I don't remember. I'm just playing kind of chordly and melody, uh, melodically. Again, you can go listen to this whole thing. Oh, I did play a solo. Whoops, there you go. Okay, so I did get into some linear ideas. And I found a melody at the end to repeat. And normally we don't play three solos on this tune. So something was definitely happening that was not like, we were definitely in a space where we were like, okay, we, we are in this, you know, we, we're sort of, we, we are searching at, th at this moment. We've played this tune a thousand times before. It is not a new tune. Um, I love playing it. It's got a lot of room for, for experimentation as you're about to hear a little bit of with Ruslan. Um, and, I start to comp again thinking that we're going to go back to the melody because there's, you know, normally, ah, we never play three solos on this. 
and I think Ruslin is just going to play a little kind of incidental filling. But then it's very obvious from the way he's starting to develop. It's not, he's not filling. He's developing a melody here. It's very obvious that we are going on. Bob has not, Bob's kneeling down. He has not picked up the horn. Like, I'm, I bury my head in the bass. I'm not even looking at anything. I'm just listening now. It is obvious we are going to solo number three. <laughs> and we're playing the form here. Something we are about to get away from. For and Russ is searching here and he's... Okay, this is, so this is where we get away from the form. I just go up to an A, uh, like a G string 14th fret, just the A. I'm not fulfilling the role of the bass. I'm not playing chords. It's barely a melodic idea, but what it is is a pedal. And um, I just sit there. I absolutely just like, fuck it. I'm here. Russ, you go for it. And let's see what you come up with. It's, it's 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 kind of forcing him to do something uh, that's it's not the form but we have this sort of we have this relationship first of all musical one that has been that has been, <laughs> been around for many many years we have a certain vocabulary that we both understand and that we're coming from similar backgrounds in terms of our harmonic and melodic background um, and the way we play together is something that has developed over the years in this band. So we know we can sort of trust each other. So as well, as as much as it might sound like I'm forcing my will <coughs> upon Ruslan to 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 play this way, it's something we do, you know, not that infrequently. Um, and pedals are always good. And as you can hear, you go check out the whole thing. Russ really comes up with this, you know, set of symphonic uh, progressions almost that develop. The ostinato in the left hand dictating the harmony. And this now a chord progression. Bob's starting to smile like, uh oh, we're going somewhere now. And at some point, I'm going to cop the root notes that Russ is playing. Let's get to... Yeah. <coughs> so rather than Russell's solo ending in this like... Da -da 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 -da, and then a huge applause, we morph into ensemble improvisation. And, and I've sort of dictated the pedal... Russell has developed this lush bed of harmony, like melody over there and mid-range harmony that wasn't affecting the root motion so much. But then when he got down into the lower register with the left hand, that was like, okay, that's a signal. Like, hey, check this out. Like, have a listen to this because this could be somewhere where we could go. Then I cop that it's like flat six, flat seven to one, roughly, with a passing chord here and there. And I move down from my high A pedal to the bass line. Russ gets into some chords and starts playing thicker and more more dense. And then Bob comes in with the delay and Gene, you know, perks up with the with, with, with sticks rather than brushes. So we get this whole new dynamic. And suddenly we're into this ensemble sound. So we've had three solos. Um, one of the end of one of which was kind of dictated by the drummer. And then I played and then Rustin played. We developed this thing together. And finally, we're at this ensemble level. 
um, which there might, for me, it's fun and everything to go play a solo out front, but there might not be a more satisfying uh, way of playing than as an ensemble, but improvising. That is that's always like a highlight of a show to me where you can get multiple people on the same page to agree on a direction without having to say anything like I was talking about before. And I don't just stay FGA here. But go ABC to create tension. Oops. And then Gene is almost soloing over it, pushing Bob with the long notes. So needless to say, I, I recommend if you if you are interested in any of this, I recommend going to check out that whole song. It's on the Yannick Wisdala Clips channel. It's entitled Maybe the Best Version of Crush we've ever played it felt really good at the time still i think it holds up and sounds pretty good now um i'm gonna leave it there i think um because that was a lot of information i'm glad to have a voice back that's not coughing too bad and be able to make it almost an hour in the podcast that is a win for me again everything is happening go to the Substack, check out a song a day we are uh, about to finish our first week it's gonna be 365 songs in a row that's crazy it's not quite like the daily vlog uh, and it's probably more useful to you as a musician than the daily vlog ever was so um go check that out on my mailing list the Substack, of course the pre-sale for the album is happening that's available at yannickwisdala.com we've got the steve smith interview coming up and a uh, whole bunch of other cool stuff and um that's it oh i think my voice just gave up right that second i feel it going all right i'm gonna quit one of my head Love you guys. Thanks for sticking around. See you on the next one. Mm -hmm.